Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Kellen Bateham with the Northwest Blacksmith Association. This is our digital demo series. This is digital demo number 18 um, with Peter Rich, hosted by Pele Warnock. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Pele, please take it from here. Thanks, Kellen. Hey, everyone. This is Pele. I am the chair of the NWBA Youth Program Committee, and we are so excited because this is going to be our first uh, digital demo with uh, one of our youth members who is very active in the community. Um, he has been blacksmithing for just over a year and has been studying uh, under Ike Bay, one of the founders of the NWBA. Uh, Peter, you're 16, right? 17, something like that. 17, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and what are you gonna be making for us today? I'm going to be making a tasting spoon. Would you like me you to go into my spiel? This... Yes, please. Tell us all about it. OK, so the tasting spoon is basically, this one is designed after kind of a Colonial Williamsburg Peter Ross design, which I got from notes from Ike Bay. So roughly based off of Peter Ross's, although definitely not as good. Um, so basically the object of the spoon is so you can reach under like a fireplace or under a tripod and then pull out your soup or whatever you are you're cooking. So this is about a little over a foot long. The ladle bowl will be three inches before we sink it. And then there's just a little hook in the back and an ornate little just handle decorative piece. I see a bunch of spoons hanging on the wall. Did you make all of those? Yeah. That's not that many. So in Williamsburg, I've heard that they're supposed to make nails first. That's their first assignment. And then they're supposed to make 12 pretty much identical tasting spoons. And I'm, those are definitely not identical, as you can see. So I'm not that good. But that was Ike's assignment. Perfection is impossible. Spoons. I'd love to see the progress. Can you show us your first spoon in comparison to the one uh, maybe that you made most recently? Uh, I think this is the first one. That's quite good. <laughs> that one looks pretty good. The second one is actually the worst. It cracked in the ladle. And then this is the most recent one, which I got some more information. I found out the angle of the handle and all that. Yeah, it looks like some nice grinding work as well. Very clean edges. Yeah, I do. you can right. file it, but I'll be doing grinding for the yeah, demo just to speed it up. Here. Yeah, you want to take us over to your anvil um, and we can get started and maybe after your demo, we can get a bit of a shop tour. Yeah, so I'm just going to show you the starting sock size. So this is four inches, one inch by quarter. And in the middle, that two inch mark, I put a tick mark. So that, that just lets me know when it's hot. I can isolate half of it for the handle and half of it will be for the spoon. Thank you, Anthony. That's Peter's father, who's being a Peter's cameraman today. So before we start, I would like to give a big thank you to Ike Bay, who has taught us a lot at the Amhill Museum. And but also fairly recently, he did give us a humongous amount of blacksmithing tools and equipment. And you'll see me using a lot of those. So thank you, Ike. Yeah, he's been a very good mentor and friend. Peter, what got you started in the blacksmithing community? Uh, actually, it was the Silly Forge and Fire Show. Yeah, so we saw that, and it was that was pretty neat. But then we really so pretty soon realized that that was not blacksmithing necessarily. So then we, yeah, we talked to Dick Stats, who is an NWBA member, and he showed us the NWBA, and. Then we went to some Swaptoberfest meetings. The first one, we didn't know even know what was really going on. Second one, we, this last one, we the guys there were really good to us. We bought an anvil there. We did got a lot of tooling from the guys. It was very good. We learned quite a bit. And then, yeah, then we went to the Yam Hill Museum. Is that where you met Ike? Yeah, that is where we met Ike. 
And you say we because uh, your father also does some blacksmithing, right? Yeah, he facilitates a lot more than he does forging, but yeah. So I'm going to start forging on the spoon. The steel's hot. I'll be using clay. This is just a brick of clay. It's a little larger, so you can see it in between heats, just what I'm doing. So I'm going to take it over to the edge of the anvil, using my tick mark, overhanging it. That's halfway in the middle of the bar. Then I'm going to just hammer very precisely, rotate it, just draw the stem down. If you have a guillotine tool, you can use that, but not everyone does. So that's what we'll be doing in steel. We just have that isolated and then our handle, and then we'll move on to working about the spoon. So did I just isolate it? It's not very clean, but it'll work. I'm just going to continue to draw this down so it's pretty much square. I don't want to go too thin here, otherwise it may break off. And I'm trying to avoid cold chunks in there. Peter, do you use your plasticine clay uh, a lot for figuring out projects on your own, or do you mostly use it for when you're showing other people what you do? Yeah, I use it for what I'm showing other people more than I've done for anything else. I have done just screwed around with knot work in the clay just to test ideas. I haven't done any in steel, but mainly just screwing around to see just knots. I don't know if this is even possible in steel, but. <laughs> If it's possible in clay, it's possible in steel, right? I don't know. <laughs> you made fast work of that. And something I've noticed consistently about Peter's form, uh, he's got really good precision. Uh, if you are new to blacksmithing, if you're old to blacksmithing, you know that doing that double set shoulder just by hand can be tricky because you can so easily uh, hit down the corner of where his spoon would be and just ruin it real quick. Um, so yeah. I, I consistently, um, you've got good aim. That's very easy to do. And all, this one doesn't have it necessarily, but if you hit with your hammer base, just right up here, it can smear some of that material over. And then there's a little burr created and that'll form a crack that will migrate into there. So if that does happen, you should try and file it away. You can even file it hot before it continues to migrate into the, the handle. Exactly. Just centering it there on the animal face. So that's about the right size for that for now. Now we're going to work on the spoon part. The panelists, uh, I hope you'll allow me since this is going to be featured as a youth demo. I might over narrate to further explain things. For example, um, Peter, you don't want to draw out that entire handle. Why? 
it can get too thin. Although I have done them by just drawing that all the way to almost final shape and it works fairly fine. You don't want to work, the, you want to kind of work the whole piece at the same time, because especially in the propane forge, because you want it to heat up at the same time, because we've got a really thick part and a thin part, the thin part will heat up a lot more. And it'll just take forever to heat up the thick part while your other parts burn it up. Mm -hmm. It's also harder to hold on to. It seems like you made it uh, a comfortable size and pair of, average pair of tongs can just grab that yeah. quarter inch square kind of thing. Oh, hey, Peter, if you make that knot in, uh, in steel, so we've already got a buyer for it. <laughs> One of the panelists is very oh my interested. Gosh. Lord have <laughs> that, that knot is, I don't think you would want that knot in your house. Is it haunted? I mean, if you got a welder, well, you could get back on. Yeah, so here's, that's what we'll be doing. I'm just gonna hook it, hook that on the anvil edge, and then I'm gonna knock this corner in, just rounding it over. This works a lot better the more established your shoulders are for the spoon, and I'm just gonna round it up. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of taper the end of it. So it's kind of domed, so the end is just a little shallower than the body of it. And that'll draw it out to three inches. So our spoon hole should be three inches in diameter before we sink it. And right now it's only two because that was the material size. Then we're gonna do the same thing on this side. Just not too much and you don't wanna, don't wanna work the handle in because that can thin it down. You want that area to be thick so it doesn't break off. I've right, necked it down. It's a little longer. I can check how long it is. So we're not quite three inches. If we do the, this side too, we'll get a little bit closer. We don't want to go all the way to three inches because when we cross paint it out, it'll get a little longer. And I noticed you're being real careful to make sure that the, the neck of your handle isn't being wrenched back and forth too much, right? Yeah, it's like the coat hanger effect. The steel, steel will get just stressed and over bent and then it'll just break off eventually. And then I was also wondering, uh, it looked like the top of the spoon might be developing a small little bit of fish lips. Are you concerned about that or does it really get worked out once you start peening it? Not a whole lot. I'm gonna grind it for speed, but also when you when you're cross painting it, it'll kind of stretch stretch her out. Nice, nice. If I wanted to, I'll start this heat and I'll get rid of them. I'll just establish it on the shoulder again and just knock them in. Just angling my hammer to do this. There's that, it's not quite center line. So I can start the next heat by trying to center it again, or I can just move to cross painting.
probably easier to hold on to the spoon face in the shape that it's in now though, right? Yeah. Now for the cross painting, Peter Ross says this a lot by the flat cross paint works very well because there, there's a lot less hammer marks in it too. So I've just taken a cross paint and just ground it flat. And then I'll just start in the middle and just work it out. Just stretch the material until I have a three inch. I'll go a little over three inches so I have room. So then it'll be stretched out. I will try and center this though. Just start in the middle, and I'm just going to continue to cross paint it until I'm at three inches. Another example of really needing to focus those blows. Yeah, you don't want to miss, especially if you have a very nice anvil. I did. Oh, yeah. So I'm just marking a three inch three inches on here so I know how big to make my circle. What are you using to make those markings? Just soapstone. It tends to fade away, but. As you can see, there are not a whole lot of cross beam marks compared to a conventional cross beam. There's still some faint lines, but they'll go away with just a flattening camera flow. Peter, would you mind showing us on your clay the way you're angling your peen? Because as we can see, the tip of your spoon is still remaining fairly small while the base is widening out. I'm just, I'll do it 92. I'm just hitting. 90 and that's stretching this out. If, if the material needs a little bit more there, I'll angle it, especially at these shoulders right here and here. I want the material to kind of come back, especially because this area will be fairly easy to do, but this area is not so much because I want to avoid the stem. But you want your ladle to look like a perfect circle and just have the stem just come out of it. So you need to be able to bring those back and grind just all the way around to a perfect circle. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be perfect, but it'll be. So don't want to take it down too thin either. So it's kind of a right in between. Okay, 
addition, I'm seeing you being more cautious also with your heats, whereas before you might, you know, give it a tweak as it's in the red or even getting a little black. Um, but as it gets thinner, caution, caution is uh, exercised. Yeah, it just moves easier under the cross paint when it's hot. And thinner so it'll heat up faster. that will probably take maybe one more cross painting heat we'll move to just a black base of the hammer very nice you can see the shape really developing this is a one inch hardy i believe it's this is thank a you. great anvil thank you i it's like 300 plus pounds it's very good anvil. Probably tell you more about it in the shop. Please do. Yeah, this That's roughly our shape. We're almost three inches across. We're over three inches long. So I'll just take the flat and face the hammer and that'll give me just a little bit of length and take out the cross paint marks. I don't know if you can hear it, but the forge is kind of sputtering. I don't know, we're, this is Ike's forge, so we're still figuring out all about it. That's where we are. We're pretty much flat. There's a couple hammer marks, but I think we'll be fine. We're three inches all the way around and over. So when we grind it, we'll be able to take it down to three inches exactly. I'm going to flip it around and draw off the handle. That's good. There's appreciation coming from the panelists as well for uh, your good tool laying out uh, in preparations for each heat. You have everything ready there. Yeah, sometimes. So you'll see that I've gone question. and talked. Oh, go ahead. It looks like you're about to answer the question about the anvil right now. Okay. Yeah. So I've drawn the, the ladle in chalk on the side of it. And I just, that's just to make sure I draw it out the right length and this this area right here is specifically I tend to draw that out longer so I'm just trying to make sure I isolate the right amount and all that nice. there is a question about your anvil um, since it doesn't have a critchel hole uh, did it break off or is it made that yeah, way? we'll talk about it in the shop tour but yeah there's a story on that Love a good story. 
I could tell it better, but yeah. As Peter draws out this handle, he's extending the material out towards the end. So he'll start on the spoon side, go towards the tip, and he's using the, the, heart, um, the horn because that helps move the material faster. Right now I'm just kind of getting it square because it wasn't necessarily square. <laughs> Sorry, it's taking so long to draw out the handle, but it'll get there. We looked at the side, there are some markings. We were pretty sure it's the hay button anvil. Answering the question about the anvil. Yeah, it's really great. I guess I'll tell the, the breakoff story now. So Ike, as far as I know, when Ike got it, it was broken off and it didn't have a hardy hole, so it wasn't necessarily a super functional anvil. So he wasn't sure what to do about it. And then Peter Ross had, um, gave him the advice to just cut it clean and then have a machinist just weld on a piece of plate. So you then have a functional hardy. quite to length. I am leaving this area a little bit thicker. And from kind of like this back back area, we, we want to taper to kind of come through. So this area needs to be thick. Then I'm going to start Can isolating this. The, the... Oh, continue. Yeah. I'm going to start isolating this area. So we'll put the hook and then for that little ornate element. Another thing to note is you brush off your scale every heat, and I appreciate that. Something like this doesn't particularly matter, but if you're doing like a knife or something where you want a clean surface, it could be could be helpful. I mean, I'd argue if you're trying to keep any of your projects clean surfaced, brushing off the scale is going to make for less grinding later. I'm just isolating how much I think I need for that stem or the ornate element and the uh, Yeah, I've narrowed down the, the handle area and I've narrowed down the hook. So I have this thick area which will cross me out for that little circular ornate piece. Oh, 
How heavy this is this is hammer that you use? I'm using a three pound hammer. This is the ornate piece we're trying to get. It should be a little rounder than this. This one's a little bit more oval, but we'll see. Very how it nice. Goes. the little tip that you just drew out. Yep. Not nice. the ornate. have the good idea of you doing some engravings or etchings into that ornate expanded part you just worked on? Uh, there has been a lot of talk about that. Um, if anybody actually buys this thing, then maybe we can try and screw around to that. They can request something, but we'll see. Yeah, my uncle, the first time we showed him the spoon, he was like, oh, you can put somebody's initials in there or something. But yeah. Good point. We also want Celtic knot work up the entire handle. Okay. I'll have to make it a little broader and flatter then. engraving I have not learned engraving from anybody this is me just brute forcing it through with some crude chisels that I made so yeah speaking of teaching yourself um, what resources have you found to be helpful of course Ike Bay and having an in-person mentor is extremely beneficial um, what are, what differences have you like felt between having Ike as your mentor versus just the internet um, as as your guide? Humongous. The internet, there's there's a lot of differing opinions, and you get cut up in that. Whereas a person like Ike or something else who has a lot more real world knowledge that he's sharing compared to some of the internet where they're, you're just doing a leaf or something, or and it's all leaf. Whereas Ike will introduce a lot of other things, other principles as well. And there's a lot less drama with the real person. Hopefully, hopefully there's a lot less drama. Good point. And they're a real person, so you get to know them. And, yeah. And the internet's not to be trusted. 
past Victorian age technology? So we're, our length looks good, our spoon looks good. Now I'm just going to take one more heat and just clean up all the faces so there's less hammer marks. And this would be where I would clean the scale off my anvil so there's no scale being pushed into the surface. Have you developed a touch mark yet? No, I'm not that good. I think the general audience and I agree, you are too modest. Centering everything, getting it all cleaned up in the last last of the heat. Do you chamfer or break those edges on the handle, or do you like to leave them pretty uh, pretty sharp? What were you saying? Do you like to chamfer or break the edges uh, on your handle? Uh, you can. I'm going to leave it square. I think all the ones I've seen of Peter Ross, they're either filed. Just leave it square or crudely file it. Nice. This all looks good. Our spoon is not quite centered. You can see it's a little crooked. So I'm going to take a heat on just that part and then center it before we move on to grinding. Yeah, I just cooled the entire handle so it doesn't heat up, and I just want that area that I'm right next to the, uh, the transition from the spoon to the handle it needs to be hot so I can straighten it out without the rest of the handle bending on me. I'll probably cool it again before I come out and work on it. We're pretty much center line. It looks pretty good before going into grinding. So now we're just going to cool the whole thing in water, and then I'm going to go to grinding. And you guys will watch that from a distance, but it's just grinding, not very exciting. You can file it, and that is probably better. A little bit slower, you won't screw up as easily. But yeah. All right, thank you. Peter, if you can hear me, what grid are you going to use? Uh, 60 grid. This happens to be the coarsest grid I think we have right now. I'm just checking my measurements. So this looks pretty good. This is not quite round to the circle, just kind of ovals out there. So I'm going to grind this in so I have a perfect circle. If I would have forged it a little bit better, it would have, I wouldn't have had that problem. All right. So I'm just grinding the ornate as well. Bio work would be a lot better on this. Now I'm moving on to a 220 grit. It's just a finer grit, so there's no rough marks on it. Are you gonna clean up both sides of the spoon face now before you uh, cup it? I do not clean up the faces. Maybe you should, but I have not. 
Everyone has their own process. That's the beauty of it. So I'm just tampering the edges. All the grinder burrs go away. I don't know if you can see the ruler, there's kind of a glare, but so we are just a hair under three inches across and our width looks pretty darn good. So, and, but we do have a little bit more thickness. So I'm gonna take one more heat on this part and just use the flat side of the hammer and flatten it out. And that'll also take out some of the, the cross peen marks that are still in there. But it should still remain fairly circular. I'm just flattening it. I can see kind of the areas that cool down faster. Those areas are thinner, so I'm going to work the areas that are kind of hotter. It's all about the same thickness, but if there happens to be an area that looks particularly thick, I'll hammer that. Okay, we're at three inches there. We're at three inches there. And now there's no cross beam marks. There's just some slight nice. hammer marks. But as we cup it, they'll kind of fade. So I'm going to dish it, and we'll do that in the stump. Uh, just on there. Right so if you have a swage block, you can do this, but or you can just use the stump. The only difference is it'll smoke a bit and change over time. I'm working on the edges first and just slowly going towards the middle. But also as it cups in, there's kind of some, I'll show you, there's kind of some wrinkles formed. So I kind of take that on the edge of the dish and just hit it with a ball paint and kind of smooth it out. Gently though. I also see that you go in a circular motion. Yeah, you kind of want to work the whole thing. And the area yeah, by, the, by the handle is just a little bit harder to sink, so just spend a little bit more time there. So this is just a fancy ball paint. There's a maker's mark on it from Ike. Somebody probably made it. You can just use a ball paint. It just looks nice. These aren't like super deep, like a ladle or something. They're kind of shallow in their curve from what I've seen. I'm just taking on the flat of the stump and just knocking those wrinkles out. I'm just trying to make it circular. What did you initially use to uh, create that shape in your stump? Uh, I think we just drilled a hole. And it, it, it's surprising how much it burns into the wood. So you do a couple or just heat up a block and put it in there and it'll burn its way in. That's that. I'm going to take probably at least one more heat. It's not quite as deep as it should probably. And there's a couple more wrinkles and it's not totally circular. So I'll just clean that up. All right. You do want to make sure your, your material is still thick enough, especially at the dishing phase. This is where you'll realize it's too thin because it'll, it'll over it'll crinkle up like paper and just either crumble away or break, or you'll, or you'll just have a hole in it. It's 
to know. is closing soon so if you would like to bid on this item please look to your chat box the current bid is at 150. Holy crap. that's pretty darn circular i think i'll take just one more heat and kind of straighten it because it does have a little kink compared to the uh handle and i'll do that on the anvil I'm just pulling the ladle part or the spoon part so I can work the handle and straighten it out in relation to the spoon. It already looks fantastic. I got to say is spoons look often very intimidating, but you make it look easy. Yeah, I would start with smaller spoons, but this is what the Williamsburg guys are starting with. So nice. give it a shot. So I'm just taking out all the, the wrinkles. They're not super prominent anymore, but there's still some sort of seam there or not seam, but a lot. I'm trying to get it circular. Do you know if the Williamsburg uh, like has a set training program and if it's available online? I do not. I'm getting a second hand for Mike, so I don't know. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, so all my knowledge about tasting spoons is I'm getting from Mike, who's probably gotten it from either Peter Ross or somebody who's fairly good at making spoons. Fairly good, yeah, pretty damn good. <laughs> So you use the hardy hole um, to kind of give it some slack for your, your peen to push into, is that right? Uh, I am now because the stump is off camera and it works mm -hmm. okay. So. You happy with that? Whoever's bidding a lot of money for this? It looks very nice. Okay, so I'm gonna just Cool that, and then I'm going to put the angle in the handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if anybody has a fireplace or a tripod, they may want to buy this. They're still cooking out of one of those. Well, actually, Peter, it sounds like Claire will be using it for her morning cereal. I think she likes big old scoops of cereal. Okay, that is a. I actually made a cereal bowl for my cousin, who that's all he eats is just cereal. So. I don't know if he uses it, but this would probably work. The ship soup will come into play as well. We're in the Pacific Northwest. It's raining, cold, cozy soup is a, co is a constant.
I really like that angle, not a full 90 degrees. I'll get the paper that has the angle. Ike sent me a picture. I hope it's fine to share his private spoon picture, but. More relaxed. Mm. Should be about the right angle. Very nice. I say a little bit too much. Just trying to clean it up. Claire just bought the spoon. She just bought the spoon. Okay, thank you for buying the spoon, Claire. Hopefully it works well for cereal or whatever you're using it for. <laughs> I want to again compliment your uh, hammering technique, considering you were saying you, you don't really uh, do much grinding or any grinding on the actual face of the spoon when it was flat before you're cupping, which means that you're doing that all with hammer marks and you're creating a clean enough surface that you don't need to sand it down. And that, that really speaks to your level of precision. There are still hammer marks in it, but it's forged, so. Yeah. And if you take, Enough you to take be a all slip, the hammer marks. Just making sure it's straight and fairly level with the spoon. That's the angle. Now I'm Very nice. Flip it around. Flip it around and work on the handle. You can do a fair, this stuff is so thin, you can do a fair amount of it cold. Or not cold, but cold. <laughs> Peter, the small spoon, I believe, is in response to the uh, panelists' discussion about your current ladle tasting spoon being the bowl and then that being the actual spoon for <laughs> the okay. theoretical cereal yeah. that is to be eaten. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Anthony. So I'm just rolling it over. You could scroll that, you could swell it and make like a finial or something, but I'm just going to do a simple hook. That was nice. Very clean. Love it. This should be a little bit more stubbier. Like if this is oval, the ones in the example are a lot more round, like kind of just a, just a circle. This is more oval. So I'm going to take one more cleanup heat, cool in the tip of it, that hook that I did, and just clean up the shaft. Comment just made here about working it a little bit colder. How do you get away with working it colder versus? Cold versus hot. Um, the hot, in, in times, it's actually good to work it colder because when you're working it hot, the whole thing will kind of move. But if you're working it colder, you can do just little little taps and just tweak it to the right shape you want. But I'm not I'm not moving the metal. I'm not forging it. I'm just bending it or straightening.
Peter, would you mind reminding us what size stock you started with for this ladle? Uh, four inches of one inch by quarter. And in the middle, I put a tick mark, which is probably where some of the cold drums come from. So if you were to able perfectly to just center it, you'd be able to get away without that tick mark. But four inches of one inch by quarter. Mild steel. Thank you. you could do it in stainless. The last demo, sorry, you're getting two cooking implements in a row, but the guy did the spatula out of stainless. So if you, you can look back at that and see how he did that and then just use that stainless for this probably. Uh, this spoon I use, I have it, which it's not a direct small uh, size down from that one just because it's there's just a little bit of mass loss or something like that. But I just have the material size of so two inches of half inch by, uh, yeah, I just have the material size. If I were to make an exact scale down, I think I would have to use a little bit larger stock, but I don't have any of that. So. Peter, have you worked with stainless steel before? I have not, as far as I know. I worked a lot of junk, but I don't know if it's stainless or not. Uh, I'm going right back. Okay, I think that looks rather good. So I'm just going to cool this, and then we'll just kind of plainish the, uh, the ladle. The bowl part. This isn't really mandatory at all. I'm just if you can see, there are still some some just in the edge. And I'm just going to bring it on the anvil face and just kind of tap them out with a ball paint. And this will also knock the loose scale out. I did ladles with Rodney at the museum, and he, he we did a fair amount of planishing there. And it came out pretty good, but for this, I won't do a whole lot of work. The long neck on your ball, ball peen seems pretty crucial for getting into those tight spaces. Yeah, that I mean, is kind of like an armor's hammer or something with a really long spaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that looks a little better. It's there's still walks in it, but I think it's about as close as I'll get it without further grinding. So I'll just planish it on I have a a ball or a trailer head. I'm just knocking the loose scale off. I'll do it fairly quickly just to show the concept. And I think for planishing you're supposed to start in the middle of the spoon, whereas when you put it in the when you make the actual dish well, that's when you're making the dish of the spoon, you start on the outside and work in, but this you'll start in the inside and work it out. A rough dimension. I'll show there's a maker mark on it. It looks like a gear. I'm sure I could tell you, but I don't know who made it, or if it was bought from a store or something like that. I don't know. There's that. You can feel some of the loose scale is gone. The hammer. So this hammer is like five and a half inches from face to face, and the face is uh, almost inch and a half across so there's two faces there's a more rounded face and then there's a more pointy face i was using the pointy face and now they're about the same so just over uh almost a little more than inch and a quarter a little more yeah and this is just a trailer hitch we could press to fit the hardy so 
there's pretty much the finished ladle or tasting spoon. Now I would like to talk about seasoning it. Seasoning it just with like your cast, you're seasoning a cast iron skillet. Uh, Claire, or I think Claire bought it. Do you want to, do you want it seasoned? If not, I'll season another spoon in front of you so you guys can see that process. Uh, Claire says yes, please. Okay. So I'm just going to season it with canola oil. So I'm going to heat it up again. I'm going to start on the spoon part. And I like to get it a little hotter, like red hot, and then walk down to that temperature. I'm sure some guys out there can just like perfectly nail the temperature and then just rub the oil on. But I'm just getting a rag oily with canola oil. And this is not a synthetic rag, just a cotton rag. So you can see it's red hot there. And now I'm just going to walk the temperature back. Just wait for it. Touch it every now and then. The handle's at that temperature where it just crystal caramelizes on there. So I'm doing that. It's all about fire in that sweet spot where it doesn't catch on fire. <laughs> yeah. Candle Still wax. is hot enough. You can do this with beeswax as well. And that, that works pretty darn good or paste wax, but that doesn't taste as good. So this is just canola oil. Really adds a nice color to it too. Yeah, I do like seasoning things compared to like painting them or putting a uh, modern finish on them. It just makes it look more rustic and will match your cast iron skillet or your cereal bowl or whatever. So I'm just oiling up the rag again. If you use the same rag for a long time, it'll get really, really dark and it'll season actually a lot better from what I found. But I'm using a fresh rag. Unsaturated? Okay. I'll try that. I'll have to try the oils you're telling me about. This is just canola oil. Those oils. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody could do a demonstration on finishes. Not me, because I don't know a whole lot, but. So I'm just going to. Oil it up just a little bit more and then get it hot until oil maybe cooks on a little darker, maybe. Well, this one looks fairly good. Some of them you'll do, there are, there are really dark spots and then really light spots, which is kind of annoying, but I think the better you get at it, the more it will be consistent. Flaxseed oil. Okay. So flaxseed oil is what everybody's saying is a thing. So that's the tasting spoon. It's been seasoned. And it's pretty much Big done. round of applause. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Fantastic so, work. So Claire, you bought this. Do you want fancy file work on it or something like that? Oh, uh, I can show you an example. This is an example I've just filed. That work. You want that or no? Well, we're okay. We'll email you or something. Claire says, like, whatever you feel like adding. So she leaves it up to your artistic opinion. Okay. Now, Peter, to wrap up today's demo, would you like to give us a quick shop tour? Show us um, what you got. I know your inventory has increased recently. Yeah, so compared to the you know, the YouTube videos, you'll see I, that was us with a fair amount of tooling, but Ike has given us a lot of tooling and we're still 
figuring that out where to put all. But most of the, the forging stuff is out and semi-organized. Uh, you have two forges, right? Uh, we have four. You have four now. <laughs> four, yeah. So we, the first forge we did was just this burner, actually, just a Venturi burner, and we put it in a bunch of fire bricks. We just stacked them up, put some plate on it, and then put this burner through the top of it, and that worked pretty good. But then we made one, so we made this, this guy, we call him the pig, just a very small, very small chamber size, like maybe two inches of, two inches of diameter. It's made out of an old fire hydrant, or no, fire extinguisher, and it just regulates the airflow. There are instructions online, I think, for how to make those, or you can ask somebody. So we made that guy, we paywalled it, and then Mizzou and Refractory, or Castellite 30, around the outside. And that guy works pretty good for like leaves and small stuff. And it doesn't use a lot of propane. So that's good for that stuff. And at the same time, we made a very big one, a ribbon burner, with the help of Dan Bauer. He did a digital demo, at least one, I think. So he's he's been a great help to us along with Ike. And that one's very big. It uses a lot more propane. It's not functional because we had to move everything and rearrange it. And this is just the ribbon burner. So it has a bunch of holes in the flame comes out of each of those. And it's forced air. So there is a blower that pushes the air in with the propane. And then this is Ike's Forge. That was the one that I was using. And that one, the nice thing about this one is that the, the blower is a separate piece. So you can take that whole top piece out and then, then your forge, you can turn the blower off and the forge heat won't come up and cook your blower. Uh, that's the forges. We also have a coal forge over there that somebody actually gave us at Oktoberfest. I don't remember his name, but thank you. It works very good. We haven't used it a lot, but not recently because we've been reorganizing things. But it works very good. Yes, yeah, so then propane tanks and then the tool rack. The tool rack, we, we don't have a whole lot of space, so we just overlap the handles. If you can see that, so they're staggered, so we can stack a lot more tools for the amount of wall space. One I can just tell setup. from uh, that you've got more, more tools on the wall from your last demonstrations. Yeah. It at least doubled our chop. Yeah, at least a lot more than that, but yeah. That's the tool rack. Um, hanging stuff on the wall that we made. Um, Oh, we'll take it. We can. Do you want to talk about the anvils now? Okay. Yes, this is Ike's anvil he gave us. It's a very good anvil. We think it's a hay button. We're pretty sure it is a hay button. Okay, it is a hay button. So this ended up breaking off. I don't know the whole story of that, but. I think when I got it, it was broken off. So I requested Peter Ross, he took it to a machinist who welded it on, welded on just a plate. So he still has a functional hardy, right? Compared to if it was broken off, you'll see a lot of anvils and they're just, it's a great brick you can pour it on, but there's no, no hardy tools you can put in there. It's a really great anvil. It's amazingly huge and works great. Did oh, the and then, stand come with it? No, we, well, he gave us a stand. We made a little bit better one. And we also plasma, or not plasma, oxyacetylene cut out um, Ike's name on it out of sheet metal and then used those as washers. So we bolted it all together. That's really fun. Looks really well set for your height. Yeah. And then this is a, well, first we were using just a chunk of mild steel that we got out of the scrapyard, but then at Swaptoberfest, uh, he has a, I don't remember his name, but he has a YouTube channel, Big Dog Forge. He sold us uh, an anvil that is very good and that we did quite a bit of stuff off of this one. It's just a little smaller, 
We have it at a little higher height. We weren't sure the anvil height at that time, but this one's a better height for me, and this one is just a little higher, which is kind of nice to have two different heights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. And you've got a vise to that stump as well, right? Yeah, we just have there a machine vise on the side of that. So and this is Ike's. So this whole bench is a low bench. It's the vise jaws are three or four inches above the anvil height. Ike actually did a article for the Hot Iron News about his vices, and he talks about this, so you can refer to that. So then it's just a lower bench, which allows you to have just beat on top of things a lot easier than the high vices. So what he did is he bent the bottom leg instead of cutting it off and crippling the vice, he just bent it over. Hmm. Then it's a lower vice without having to cut it off. Or bury it. Clever. Yeah, so then a lot of our tools and Ike's tools are kind of been organized. His his tool rack design, a lot of his tools. Yeah, and then we have a whiteboard for drawings and displaying ladles and yeah. Hmm? Oh yeah. So then we, we did make a grinding station. So that's what you saw me doing over here. This is Ike's belt sander. Just a wire wheel and a buffing wheel, a uh, bench grinder. Um, we, do, we did put in a, just box fans that go up to an exhaust system. My dad did that just so I'm not having to breathe in fumes and all that. That's Very the grinding station. Important. Still needs some development. And then this is the welding station. which is still not totally functional, but it's, we can weld stuff. Which is, that's not proper blacksmithing, but it's still part of the shot. There's a question about how you got started in forging. How I got started in forging? Um, it was the Forge and Fire show. I saw that, that was the first experience with blacksmithing, I think. And then after that, we, we talked to a guy who we knew who was a, who was actually a blacksmith. I think he's he's an NWB mem, BAM member, I think. Dick Stats, and thank you to him. He showed us a fair amount of stuff and brought us to the MWBA. Um, and then we went to Swaptoberfest, and the first year that we went, we just kind of sat back and watched. We didn't know anything really; just watched a bunch of guys forging. And then after that, after that, we got a. Uh, we made an anvil, made a forge, just kind of got the minimum of tools and then just started making stuff. And then this last Swaptoberfest, we went and we were able to actually absorb information and learned a lot. Thank you to the demonstrators at that Anton or Arnon and uh, who else did one? Yeah, there's a lot of good guys who did demos there. Thank you to them. And then after that, the one of the presidents of NWBA sent us an email to pointed us towards Yamhill Museum, which is where we bumped into Ike and Dan Bowyer and yeah, Dale, who's kind of the museum guy, Rodney. He did we did some ladles with him and a rose. He taught me how to do roses. Um, yeah, so thank you to those guys. And that's about it. Thanks for sharing your story. I gotta say as, you know, you're a modest human, but you've worked very, very hard over just a year and a half-ish, right? We're going into two years of your blacksmithing work. And I just think it's important, uh, adult, youth, wherever you are in your blacksmithing career or passion uh, to not be intimidated by needing a bunch of big tools because you start with the most rudimentary stuff and, and right. And that's all you need. Yeah, a lot of it's skill. Like you see some really good Smiths and they can just go to a chunk of steel. Like there's some guys in India, you see YouTube videos of them and they're making amazing stuff on just a brick of steel and they got a hammer and anvil and maybe a grinder and they're just making absolutely amazing stuff off of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Good point. Thank you. I think that's well worth mentioning uh, in this day and age of stuff that it's all about the time you put into it. Have a good mentor to focus 
Yeah, and you need a very good mentor, which is very helpful. Thank you to Ike. Next project I want to learn. Uh, I've been doing tasting spoons. I'm going to actually do a belt buckle probably fairly soon, maybe today. But I've done some leaf belt buckles. A leaf belt buckle, I think it will be, and a belt actually on, I think they may be on the auction, and an ice cream scoop, which is on the auction as well. Very nice. And to all of you watching live right now or later on when this gets posted on YouTube, um, if you are a youth or you have a youth in your family who is interested in becoming part of our community, learning more blacksmithing, demonstrating, just like Peter here, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. Come to our website at blacksmith.org um, and get in contact with us and we can go from there. We're trying to expand this youth program more because the whole community needs to learn no matter what your age. Thank you so much, Peter. Do we have any other questions from our panelists or comments? Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you so much, Pele, for uh, putting in all the time today. Thank you for having me. Fantastic demo, Peter. We look forward to seeing you again soon.